Now shall we turn in our Bibles to Psalm 33 for our scripture reading today. I'll read the first, the odd-numbered verses. Pastor Brian will lead the congregation in the reading of the even-numbered verses. And shall we stand to read the Word of God? Psalm 33. Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Praise the Lord with harp, sing unto him with the psaltery and an instrument of ten strings. Sing unto him a new song, play skillfully with a loud noise. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathereth the waters of the sea as an heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. The Lord looketh from heaven, he beholdeth all of the sons of men. In the face of his habitation, he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashioneth their hearts alike. He considereth all their works. There is no king save by the multitude of an host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. And a horse is a vain thing for safety, and neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy. To deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in thee. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you today, we thank you for your word and for the certainty, the steadfastness of your word, that what you have said, you have brought to pass and you will bring to pass. Lord, may we put our trust in you and in your word, that we might have that blessed assurance, knowing, Lord, that your word is steadfast and true. Bless now, we pray, the study of your word. Open our hearts, Lord, to the things of the Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Tonight we will be going through Ezekiel chapters 23 and 24 as we continue our journey through the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation. So we encourage you to study over these chapters and join with us tonight and hopefully any questions that might arise in your mind as you are reading will be answered for you tonight as we go through chapters 23 and 24 of Ezekiel. This morning, we'd like to draw your attention to the 24th chapter, verse 14, where we read, I, the Lord, have spoken it. It shall come to pass. I will do it. I will not go back, neither will I spare, neither will I repent. According to thy ways and according to thy doings, 
shall they judge thee, saith the Lord God. If God has said something, what do you suppose are the probabilities of that coming to pass? It might interest some of you to know that up to this point, God is batting a thousand percent. At the time of Solomon, as he was dedicating the temple, he said, Blessed be the Lord that has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. There has not failed one word of all his good promise which he promised by the hand of Moses his servant. And since the days of Solomon and his declaration that not one word has failed of all of his promises, we can say today, some 3,000 years later, that what Solomon said is true today as it was in the days that Solomon spoke it. Not one word of God has failed. We notice here in chapter 24 that Ezekiel is prophesying the siege, the final siege, and the destruction of Jerusalem. We note at the beginning of the chapter, verse 1, he is careful to give to us the date of this prophecy. Again, in the ninth year, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying. So it's the ninth year of the reign of King Zedekiah. It is the tenth month and the tenth day of the month. When you go back to 2 Kings, chapter 25, verse 1, this very date is given to you also, the tenth day of the tenth month of the ninth year of King Zedekiah. And we are told there in 2 Kings that this is the day that the siege of Jerusalem be began by the Babylonian army. Israel, Jerusalem was about 500 miles away. Ezekiel didn't have a telephone, nor did he have radio transmissions. But on this very day, he had the word of the Lord. And the very day that the siege of Jerusalem began, he gave this prophecy in chapter 24 in which he describes the siege and the success of the siege of the city of Jerusalem by the Babylonian army. Could not have known this except by the Spirit of the Lord. It would be weeks before a runner could come and inform the people that the siege of Jerusalem had begun. But there in Babylon, he is informing the people of the beginning of this siege. Ezekiel was fond of using illustrations. And here he set out a great cauldron. He put water in it. He built a fire on it, under it. He cut up an animal and put it in to the boiling water with all of the bones, with all of the meat. As it was boiling, of course, the scum formed, but he didn't wipe away the scum. He continued the fire until the water was all boiled out, until the meat was burned to char until the bones were charred, as he is describing to the people that God, because of the scum, because of the sin, was going to establish this 
siege against Jerusalem and Jerusalem would be burned and would be destroyed because of the sin of the people. As God pronounces this judgment upon Jerusalem, he said, And I, the Lord, have spoken it. It shall come to pass. I will do it. I will not go back. Neither will I spare. Neither will I repent. According to thy ways, according to thy doings, shall they judge thee, saith the Lord God. The Lord here gives a threefold confirmation of the truth of this matter. I have spoken it. It shall come to pass. I will do it. There's no changing. I will not go back. I will not spare. I will not repent or change. What can you say that history tells us? It tells us that the siege of Jerusalem began on that very day, the ninth year of King Zedekiah, on the tenth day of the tenth month. And that Jerusalem fell to the Babylonian army and that they were utterly destroyed. Those that survived physically were taken as captives. God was faithful in keeping his word. And God is faithful to keep his word. That fact should bring you either great comfort or great terror. It all depends on how you are living. If you've put your trust in the Lord, then what great comfort it is to know that God will indeed do what he said. If you've gone against the word of God, if you are living in sin, then you should be terrified by the fact that God always keeps his word. In Psalm 19, 17, it said, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all nations that forget God. God keeps his word. The wicked shall indeed be turned into hell. Jesus, who knew more and should know more than any person on the subject of hell spoke about and warned about the judgment of hell more than any other writer in the Bible. Just one of the many examples of the declarations of Jesus concerning hell is found in Mark, Mark 9.45 where Jesus said if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to be crippled through life than having two feet and to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where the maggots do not die and the fire is not quenched. Some people say, well, I don't believe in hell. Whether or not you believe it doesn't alter its existence. There may be aspects of it that I don't understand. The torment and all. I don't fully understand. I don't pretend to fully understand. But I take God's word for it. I believe what God's word says is true. There are many skeptics who sort of scorn the idea or the thought of punishment for the wicked. 
But I will take the word of Jesus over the word of any skeptic. And if Jesus declares that it is so, then I believe that it is so, though I may not fully understand it. The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. Now, the Bible does affirm the certainty of God's word. What God has said is true and it shall come to pass. In Numbers 23, 19, we read, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. What he has said, shall he not do it? What he has spoken, shall he not make it good? Isaiah wrote, the grass withers, the, the flower fades, but the word of God shall stand forever. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Paul wrote, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Peter wrote, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. In Ezekiel 36, we'll be getting there towards August. We read where God said, for I will take you, that is the Jews in the last days, from among the heathen. I will gather you out of all countries. I will bring you into your own land. And the desolate land will be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. And they shall say, this land that was desolate is become like the garden of Eden. And the waste and the desolate and the ruined cities are fenced and are inhabited. And then the heathen that are left round about you shall know that I, the Lord, build the ruined places and plant that, that which is, was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. I like it when God sort of brags. He says, I said it, I'll do it. I mean, be sure. Now, had you gone to Israel a hundred years ago and you had seen Israel at that time, you would have said God didn't keep his word. For just a hundred years ago, the land was still very barren. If you read Mark Twain's account of his visit to Israel as he talks about the barren wilderness and just how barren the land actually was. A hundred years ago, you would have said, well, God may have said it, but he sure didn't do it. But if you go to Israel today and you see that land which was once desolate and you see it today as it is as the Garden of Eden. If you'd see all of the beautiful orchards, all of the fields of grain, if you would see uh, how the land has been developed agriculturally, as you would see uh, the uh, trees covering the mountains and all, you would have to say, he did do it. God said it, he did it. And you can see it today. It's a witness. It's a testimony of the fact that God does keep his word. Ezekiel wrote these words in about 587 B.C. So a little over 2,500 years ago. 
And now they are fulfilled within the last 50 years or so. It is amazing to look at that land and see how God did exactly what he said he would do there in Ezekiel as he prophesied in chapter 6, the recovery of the land. I think of all of the wonderful things that Jesus has said. The promises that he has given to us who will believe in him and follow him. And what blessed assurance it brings to my heart to know that he will keep his word. Jesus said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, then I will come again, and I will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And where I'm going, you know, and the way, you know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus answered and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come to the Father but by me. The word, the promise of Jesus. If I go away, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And when I read these words of Jesus, I'm encouraged because I know that God keeps his word. His promises do not fail. Because of my believing in Jesus, I have the promise that I will not perish but have everlasting life. Because I believe in Jesus, I have the promise that he is coming again to receive me unto himself that where he is, there I might be also. In the book of Revelation, as Jesus is addressing the church, he gives many promises to those within the church that would overcome. He gave many warnings to those who were going sideways, those who were not keeping his word, and many warnings to them. But to those who would overcome, he said that he would give to them to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. He said they would not be hurt of the second death. He said that he would give them hidden manna to eat and give them a white stone and in the stone a new name written which no man knows except he that receives it. He said that he would give to them power over the nations. He said that he would confess their name before the Father and before his angels. He said that he would write upon him the name of God and the name of the city of God, which is the new Jerusalem, which comes down from heaven from God, and he would write upon him his new name. And then he also promised that uh, he would grant to them to sit with him on his throne, even as he also overcame and has sat down with the Father on his throne. The Bible teaches that there are two basic paths that you can take in life. That one of them leads to eternal life, the other leads to eternal damnation. Daniel wrote about just 
the two destinies for all men. He said, Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. The path that you are walking, where does it lead? There is a path that leads to everlasting life. There is a path that leads to shame and everlasting contempt. As we journey through life, all of us one day come to that cross in the road where we must make our decision as to which path we will take. The one is the path of the cross. The denial of self that I might live as Jesus would have me to live to come after him he said you must deny yourself take up your cross and follow him this is one of the things that I see as a danger in many of the churches today that are preaching a comfortable gospel. It isn't that what they say is necessarily wrong, but it's what they don't say that deceives people. You don't hear of self-denial. You don't hear of taking up the cross. You don't hear of following Jesus fully and completely. But that's what God's word tells us we must do. The other path is a comfortable path. It's a path of self-indulgence. Living to please yourself. The chief goal of life, your pleasure, your ease. And you are the center of your life. The one path, Jesus, is the center of your life. In this path, you are the center of your life. But the one leads to everlasting life. In Revelation 22, verse 1, he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of the street and on either side of the river, there was a tree of life which bore twelve different fruit. And it yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. There shall be no night there, and there is no need for candle, neither the light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And then in verse 6, he said unto me, these sayings are faithful and true. God keeps his word. What God has declared, God will surely do. As he said, I have spoken it. It shall come to pass. I will do it. He affirms that he will keep his word. The other path leads to, as Daniel said, shame and everlasting contempt. Today, each one of us are walking a path through life. It would be well, it would be wise if each of us 
would carefully examine the path that we are on and ask ourselves the question, where does this path lead me? Does it lead me to everlasting life? Or does it lead me to shame and everlasting contempt? God will keep his word one way or the other. Which path are you on? Father, help us this day to take a close examination of ourselves. For you have told us that we should judge ourselves. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged by you. Help us, Lord, to take a look at our lives and the path that we are on. Help us, Lord, to look at the center of our lives. Is Christ the center of our life? Or are we living a self-centered life? Help us, Lord, to honestly evaluate and judge so that we might be sure, be certain that we are on the path of life. We know that Straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to everlasting life. May we be willing, Lord, to walk that narrow way as we deny self to take up the cross that we might follow you. Lord, we pray that today those that are on the broad path leading to destruction might be awakened by your Holy Spirit, might realize, Lord, where their path is leading, and may they, Lord, change from that path to the path that you have set before us. For you are the way, the truth, and the life. May we know, Lord, the truth and experience that life in Jesus name amen for our scripture reading shall we turn now to Psalm 119 don't panic we'll only read the first 18 verses <laughs> shall we stand as we read the Word of God Psalm 119 verses 1 through 18 Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. They also do no iniquity, they walk in his ways. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes, O forsake me not utterly. Whether withal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee, O let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies, as much as in all riches. I will meditate in thy precepts, and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes, Deal bountifully with thy servant, that I might live and keep thy word. Open thou my eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Let's pray. 
Father, we do echo the prayer of David that you would open our eyes today that we might behold wonderful things out of your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word is indeed a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. May we walk, Lord, in the light of your truth. Bless the study of your word today. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. You may be seated. Tonight we will be studying Ezekiel's chapter 25 and 26 as we continue our journey through the Bible. This morning we want to draw your attention to Ezekiel 26, verse 1, where the prophet declares, It came to pass in the eleventh year, in the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me. Ezekiel claims that God spoke to him. It was the 11th month of the year of King Zedekiah, which would make it the year 587 B.C. It was the first of the month that God, Ezekiel claimed, spoke to him. Now, there are many people who claim that God has spoken to them. Many of these people that make such claims are mentally troubled. I had a man who was in my church in Tucson at the beginning of my ministry, and he had brought into the adult Sunday school class a false doctrine. The teacher came to me and said that he had gotten in an argument in the class with the teacher and that I should go to the class and correct the false doctrine that this man was espousing. So I did go to the adult Sunday school class and I pointed out that this man was espousing a heresy, that it wasn't according to the scriptures. Well, the next day I received a call from this man. He invited me to come over to his house. And he said that he had been in prayer and that God spoke to him through a vision. And in his vision, he said he saw, he was in a funeral service and he saw the casket there in the front. And when he went by the casket and looked in the casket, I was the one that was lying in the casket. <laughs> and that the Lord had told him that if I did not go back to that adult class and correct the things that I had said, that within two weeks I would be dead. Well, obviously he was wrong. <laughs> I'm still here. And that was over 50 years ago. So. Uh, there are people who are delusional. It's an unfortunate thing for this particular man in that we did discover that he had a brain tumor. And in two weeks, I had his funeral service. And I mentioned to someone, he just saw the wrong face in the casket. But uh, there are people who are delusional, who think that God speaks to them. I believe that there are people who are genuinely deceived into thinking that they heard the voice of God when in reality it was just something in their own imagination or heart. You remember when Jesus said to his disciples, who do people say that I am? And as they told Jesus the various thoughts, he said, but who do you say that I am? And they said, well, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father, which is in heaven. And I say unto you that you're a little stone, but upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. 
And from that time, Jesus began to tell his disciples how that he would be turned over to the Gentiles. They would crucify him. But the third day, he said, he would rise again. Peter began to rebuke Jesus and say, Be that far from you, Lord. And Jesus said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. You offend me. You can't tell the difference between what comes from God and what comes from man. And that quite often is a difficulty. Discerning whether or not God has really spoken to me or is this something that has just been generated in my own mind, in my own imagination, or is God indeed speaking to me? Some who have made the claim that God was speaking to them are charlatans. They go around and saying that God has spoken to me, that you're to give me a thousand dollars, you know. It's interesting that in the early church they did have problems with false prophets who were going around sort of taking advantage of the new believers. Coming in with supposedly the gift of prophecy. And, and they would do that. They would uh, prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord, give this man a hundred dollars to help him on the way. And so the apostles wrote a letter to the churches and they warned them if some fellow comes in claiming to be the prophet or a prophet and he says in the name of the Lord that you're to support him and to help him and all financially, he is not a true prophet of God. And, and so they had warnings in the early church against such people that would say that God showed them that you were to help them out financially and things of that nature. My son Chuck Jr., when he was an assistant pastor here at Calvary, actually finally left here because there were so many young girls that came to him and said the Lord had shown them that they were to be his wife. And so he panicked and, and moved out to 29 Palms. And, uh, <laughs> but people can be sincerely mistaken about God speaking to them or hearing the voice of God. How can we really know that when a person claims that God has spoken to them, that it was really God who did indeed speak? We're told in the scriptures not to believe every spirit, but to try the spirits and see if they really are of God. Paul warns in, in the 1 Corinthians 14 that when a person exercises the gift of prophecy, that others were to judge. Uh, to judge to see if it really is in line with the scriptures. But the primary test of a true prophet is that the details that he speaks about come to pass as he said they would. And if a man comes and gives a prophecy of a future event, giving you a lot of details about that future event, if that indeed then does take place, it is good evidence that the man is a true prophet of God. In Deuteronomy, the Lord said, When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, and if the thing follows not, nor comes to pass, the Lord did not speak that thing, but the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. God said that he was against such people who say, well, the Lord told me when God said, I didn't tell them. The Lord said, and God said, I didn't say. Jeremiah 23, 32, Behold, I'm against them that prophesy false dreams and say that the Lord told them and they cause my people uh, that are, uh, they cause them to err by their lies and by their uh, lightness 
I sent them not, nor did I command them, the Lord said. Prophecy, I believe, is one of the strongest proofs that the Bible is indeed the Word of God. I believe that it is proof that there is a God who does exist and that he is transcendent of time and of space. In the Bible, God offered his ability to declare the end from the beginning as proof that he was indeed God and that he had spoken. In Isaiah 46, 9, he said, I am God, there is no other. I am God and there is none like me who can declare the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. In fact, God challenged the false prophets who were prophesying in the name of their false gods to offer evidence that their gods were true gods by doing what God did, telling of things in advance. Isaiah 41, 21, God said, Produce your cause, saith Jehovah. Produce your strong arguments, saith the king of Jacob. Let them show us what is going to happen. Let them declare to us the things that will happen in the future that we may be confounded or astounded when we see it happen. His ability to tell the end from the beginning is proof that he does exist outside of our time continuum. Now, I, Ezekiel said the word of the Lord came to him. What did the word of the Lord say to him. The word of the Lord came to him to prophesy concerning that great maritime city of Tyre, the base for the Phoenician army, one of the strongest cities in the ancient world. Tyre had conquered the Mediterranean Sea. They had set colonies around the Mediterranean, North Africa, uh, along in Spain, and their ships went as far as England, bringing tin and so forth back to the city of Tyre. It had become more or less the trade center of the early world, and the Phoenician navy ruled the early world. And so there were prophecies concerning this ancient city of Tyrus. And in the prophecies here, uh, the Lord declared that he would cause many nations to come against her in verse 3. That is, the defeat of Tyrus would not be by a single nation, by, but by a combination of many nations. And uh, it is interesting that two years after this prophecy, Nebuchadnezzar started his siege against the city of Tyrus. The siege lasted for 13 years, but was successful as he destroyed the city of Tyrus that was built on the mainland. 240 years later, Alexander came and he conquered the city of Tyrus, the new city that was built on the island that was a half mile offshore of the mainland city of Tyrus. Tyrus remained a city till the age of the Crusaders, but they were defeated in 1291 AD and then Tyrus and the site of Tyrus became lost in the centuries that followed. So that at one time, the Bible skeptics even 
uh, made fun of the Bible because it mentioned the city of Tyrus and all, and they said it was just a myth that such a city did not exist because they could find no site of the ancient city of Tyrus. In verse 4, the Lord said concerning Tyrus that they would destroy the walls, they would break down her towers, I also will scrape her dust from her, make her like the top of a rock, and it shall be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Interesting prophecies. It gives you details. Breaking down her towers, scraping her dust from her, causing her to become like the top of a rock, a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea. And this is a general summary of what would happen to Tyrus over a period of time. But then he goes into further detail. He then begins to tell of how that he would bring Nebuchadnezzar against Tyrus. Verse 7. The Lord then declared that he would bring Nebuchadnezzar against the city. And one year after Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed Jerusalem in 586, he began his siege in 585 against the city of Tyrus. As I said, it took 13 years but he finally was able to destroy the walls and to conquer the city. However, in that 13 years, the people who were living in Tyrus got sort of tired of the siege. And because of their strong navy, they actually built a secondary city on an island just a mile offshore. And in this 13-year period of time, they transferred all of the wealth and the treasure of Tyrus out to the island city, and most of the people also moved on out to the island city, so that by the time Nebuchadnezzar uh, conquered the city, it was a very empty victory because the treasures had all been transferred and the most of the people... Uh, he in anger really slaughtered those that did remain as is described uh, in uh, these verses here of his conquering of the city of Tyrus. Now in verse 12, you will notice something quite interesting. The siege and destruction of Tyrus by Nebuchadnezzar is described in verses 7 through 12 and it speaks of he, 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 Nebuchadnezzar, he. And suddenly in verse 12, there's a change of pronouns from he to they. And that is quite significant because he, Nebuchadnezzar, did not do all of the things that were prophesied would be done to Tyrus. 240 years later, Alexander the Great, as he was making his way towards Persia to seek to conquer the great empire of Persia, he felt that just moving directly east could be dangerous because of the strong Phoenician navy. He felt that his flanks would be open to attack if he were involved in war in Persia. So he felt that it was necessary to sort of support himself that he conquer Tyrus before moving on to Persia. He came to the city of Tyrus and he demanded that they surrender to him. But those in the city of Tyrus refused to surrender. They knew that there was a half mile of ocean or sea, the Mediterranean Sea, between uh, the land and their island fortress. They had their strong navy and they felt that it was foolish to just surrender to Alexander the Great. And so he gathered together a fleet of ships 
from the surrounding area, and he attempted a naval invasion of Tyrus, which was repulsed because of the strong Phoenician navy. He then set up a different ploy. Because of the old city of Tyrus, the rocks, the timbers, the buildings, the uh, were, were rumble now, just big stones and timbers. He decided that he would build a causeway from the mainland out to the island. And so he had his troops begin to take the rocks, uh, the stones that once made up the walls and the houses, the timbers, and to cast them in the midst of the sea to build this causeway out to the island. It was a successful ploy inasmuch as he was able then to move his weapons of war, the uh, big uh, machines of war in those days uh, to destroy the walls and to scale the walls. He was able to move them on this causeway out to the island and he did conquer the city of Tyrus. And of course, as I said, it is described in our uh, text here as they, they, they. And as you read of how he conquered the city of Tyrus, it is very interesting then to look at the prophecy. Ezekiel said God spoke to him and God showed him these things and it happened just as Ezekiel said it would. He said, And I will cause the noise of thy songs to cease. The sound of the harps shall be no more heard. And he goes on to tell how that they would take uh, the stones and uh, the uh, timbers and cast them in the midst of the sea and they would scrape the dust or the dirt, and cast it into the sea. Exactly what Alexander the Great did some 240 years later. And so, uh, fascinating prophecies proving that indeed it was the word of God that had come to Ezekiel just like he said that God had spoken to him. The details of the destruction of Tyrus have many interesting facets to them. And if you would take the chance factors of the seven distinct predictions of its destruction and using a conservative estimate of each one of them coming to pass. You have what is called the law of compound probabilities. Taking each one and the chance that each one would happen, multiplying those chances, the chance of all seven of the predictions that Ezekiel made concerning the destruction of the city of Tyrus, there would be only one chance in 75 million that his prophecies could have been fulfilled. I could say that we could safely assume that when Ezekiel said the word of the Lord came to me, that he was correct, that it was God that was speaking to him of the judgment that would come against Tyrus. Now, the Bible claims to be the Word of God. It purports to be God's revelation of himself to man. Can you trust the Bible to be all that it claims to be? I find it very interesting that for almost 2,000 years since the completion of the canon of scriptures, 
that men and women, thousands of them, have searched carefully through the Bible looking for some error, some mistake, something that was said that did not happen in order that they can discredit the Bible and show and prove that the Bible is not the Word of God. After 2,000 years of such scrutiny, you think that someone could have come up with some kind of evidence to discredit our believing the Bible. Evidence so powerful that we say, well, it can't be God's word because it is so far off base. Years ago, I took a, a science in the Bible class at Biola College that was taught by Dr. Uh, Harry Rimmer. And he had a standing offer at that time of $10,000 to anybody who could prove one scientific error in the Bible. Now, the Bible is not a scientific textbook, but it does touch on scientific subjects, and if it is God's Word, it should be correct when it touches on scientific subjects. So he offered this $10,000 reward to anyone who could prove that there was a scientific error in the Bible. Interestingly enough, that reward was never collected. The Bible is an amazing book, purports to be God's revelation of himself to us. What has God revealed about himself in the Bible? Well, he declares that he is the eternal God, that he created this universe in which we live, and he created all of the life forms within the universe. And he created them for his own good pleasure, and he created man that he might have a meaningful, loving relationship with man that man might know him, that man might have a close relationship, a loving relationship with him, where he could lavish his love upon man and they in turn would declare their love for him, a close, loving, intimate, loving relationship. Now, for this intimate, loving relationship to take place, it would be necessary that God, when he created man, Create him with self-determination, or that is, give to man the capacity of choice. You see, you can't force somebody to love you and know that they truly do. If you hold a 45 to the skull of this gal and say, Say you love me, or I'll blow your brains out. She says, I love you. Are you sure? <laughs> you can't force love, you see. Love has to be a free choice. And God wanted to know that you truly love him. You can't have a meaningful, loving relationship with a robot. Again, it's mechanical. God doesn't want a mechanical relationship. He wants a true loving relationship. And so he created man with the capacity of choice. But having the capacity of choice would not be valid unless there was something to choose. So when God put Adam and Eve in the garden, he put in that garden a tree that had luscious looking fruit probably a fabulous aroma, very desirable. But God said, don't eat of the fruit of that tree. All of the trees that are in the garden, you might freely eat of their fruit, but don't eat of the fruit of that tree. 
So now there is the capacity of choice and also something to choose. Something that seems very attractive and desirable. Man has now to choose to obey God or to choose to obey the desires of his flesh. To not eat of it and remain true in his relationship, proving his love to God, or following the lust of his flesh, sampling that fruit to see if it's as delicious as it smells and as it looks. We know the story. Adam ate of the fruit broke his relationship with God. He gave in to the desires of his flesh and they became stronger than his desire to live in fellowship with God. And in so doing, his relationship with God was broken and he was alienated from God. God's experiment, you might say, failed with Adam's sin. The problem is God still loved man. God wanted to restore man back to fellowship. And so the Bible teaches us that God, because he so loved the world, that he sent his only begotten son to take our sins and to die in our place so that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And so God made the way whereby fallen man might be restored to the original divine intent for man. It is now, again, choice. I can choose to believe that the Bible is God's word, and that what it says is true, and that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and he died for my sins, and by my believing in him, I've been forgiven my sins, and I have fellowship with God, and I have the promise of eternal life with God. Or, I can choose not to believe it, I can choose to continue to live after my flesh and try to find meaning in life and meaning for life apart from God and try to find it in drugs, try to find it in sex, try to find it in success or in, in the many things that people are pursuing after today in order to find some fulfillment. I saw this thing, the Kabbalahism, maybe you saw it uh, the other night on, on TV, I think it was 2020 or one of the programs, Dateline. But anyhow, here is Madonna and all of these people, and they are searching for meaning. I mean, it was, it was ridiculous. Uh, to watch them, it was, you think, how could a sane, intelligent person get involved in something like that uh, because, uh, you know, it, it promises some mystical experience. You know, if you do enough of the dances and, and all, you can get some kind of a mystical feeling of, you know. Uh, <laughs> and and, and it, was, it was sad, sad indeed how people are trying to find a meaningful experience in life apart from God and the quest and the search that they are on. I have discovered in my own personal life that indeed it is possible to have a meaningful relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That God's word has proven itself to be true in my own heart and life over and over and over again. And when the prophet Ezekiel said, the word of the Lord came to me, I believe that God was speaking to him because the things that he talked about came to pass completely. Now we're going to move on in Ezekiel. And in a few weeks, 
we're going to find that Ezekiel is talking about things that are happening in your world today. So God's word is still coming to pass and is even speaking of things that are going to happen in the next few years. Still yet future, but the world is shaping up for these things to happen. And as you look at the world, you realize how that it is shaping up and about to happen. choice you choose to believe or choose not to believe you choose to follow after God and to live in a loving relationship with God or you choose to follow after your flesh and try to find fulfillment in and through the flesh it's your choice I pray that God will help you to make the right choice you see, the ball is in your court now. It's up to you what you choose. Father, we thank you for the fact that you have revealed yourself in your word. And that through that revelation, we've come to know you and to love you and to serve you. We thank you, Lord, for the rich fulfillment that we have in loving you and experiencing your love for us. We are so grateful, Lord, that we made that choice to believe in your word and to believe upon your Son who you sent to die for our sins. Lord, there are those today that are here that today are making the choices whether to seek to live after your commandments or to live after the lust of their own flesh, to obey you or to obey their own lust. Help them, Lord, to see the emptiness and the folly of living after the flesh and may they come, Lord, into the life of the Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.